presentation are two folks you'll recognize. We have Joanne Ford of the FAA and Alex Siebel of Flight Tech. They will be coming up to talk to you about Point in Space and update on that project. So a round of applause for them, please. And a quick announcement. If you have silent auction items, please head outside briefly to pay for those before five o'clock as that's when that closes. Okay, thank you. And thank you all for being here, uh, especially so late in the afternoon after that wonderful lunch that we had and all of the wonderful speakers that we had as well. But thank you all for, for hanging in. I think we have some very good news for you. That's what we always try to do, at least give you some sense of what we are accomplishing and what we hope to accomplish for the future. But my, um, my nephew, before I left, um, said, Auntie, you're supposed to start with a joke. And I said, okay, honey, do you have any jokes you can tell me? He said, sure. He said, do you know that they've invented a new airplane that can bounce? It won't ever crash. And I said, really? What's it made of? He said, it's made of rubber polymers. And it's invented by a company, Boeing, Boeing, Boeing. Isn't that cute? Six, six years old, it was very good. Aviation related already. So some good news very quickly. Um, yesterday, Jackie Holzman and Kevin Hubbard from the FAA Alaska region said that they do have some statistics with respect to how many automated weather systems are actually out of service. Um, that's never good news, but uh, some good news. I just received an email that the Perryville, Alaska AWAC was commissioned February 2nd, 2024. And just to be sure that um, that, that information was correct, uh, Vince Massimini and I actually called the number and, and it is broadcasting. So slow progress, but, but, um, but at least some progress for Perryville. Um, and the one thing I wanted to add for the last speakers we had, she indicated that the average that a tourist spent was about 1,000 or 1,500 when they come to Alaska. What she failed to say was the exception is for the week of the Alaska Air Carriers Association, and the exception is for me, because we certainly, those of us that come here with the wonderful auctions that you have, none of us spend any less <laughs> or any, uh, any less than $1,500. So you keep it up. Well, thanks to, thanks to everybody. Yeah, thank you. So as I said, we, we do try to, whatever advice, whatever you have to say to us as far as what you want, especially in the line of navigation, that we do try to bring you some, some very good news. Um, the FAA, and you hear me say this every year, we try to do the best we can with the funding that we have. And despite the competition for funding, we try to do whatever we can, especially in the state of Alaska, because you do need, um, you do need the, the safer um, uh, approaches that, that WAS LPV can offer you. And thanks to so many of you and your companies who have um, accepted the challenge years and years ago and equipped, uh, and equipped your flight with, with WAS LPV, because it certainly is safer and much more economical. The thing is, with, with the FAA, we reached, uh, even though we kept trying to find other things to do with the WAS technology, we did reach a stalemate in that the only thing we could do was really just provide straight ends for WAS LPVs, which were fine. I mean, it's still vertically guided, and it's certainly better than not having any vertically guided approach 
uh, previously, but the, we slowly started running out of runway ends, and there still are some available, but runway ends for the straight ends. Furthermore, even though we knew that the WASP technology could still provide us with, with, um, with other uh, advantages, both in route and for approaches other than just straight ends, and with single frequency rather than waiting for the dual frequency, the FAA failed to have the automation as well as the resources to be able to make any of that happen. But thank goodness for companies such as Flytech Engineering, who have the vision, who have the technology, who have the work ethic. And I, I just thank God every day um, for his bringing us together so that we could use the, the WASP technology that we have in far better ways than, than we have in the past with just straight ends. With advanced WASP LPV approaches, um, we have, who would ever have imagined that we would be able to have a WASP LPV to water with float planes? But we've not only done it once, we've done it twice. And you'll, I don't want to steal all of their thunder. Um, so they are uh, going to come up and speak to you about what we have been doing here in the state. We have a lot more planned for 2024. I will just sidebar a little bit and say that the one thing um, we still need to talk about with all of you, with, especially with your membership, is GPS resiliency and where we want to go with that. We know we have a minimum operating network for the lower 48, but as FOSI uh, and Ken Hubbard, uh, Ken Hubbard described yesterday, with one of the FOSI recommendations, we are developing a GPS resiliency plan for the state of Alaska, which is gonna help tremendously. We have a DVT program that's being developed and funded, but that'll still be another two or three years, but at least it's, it's all very promising. So there's more on that. Feel free to, to call or text or write or whatever if you want more information on that. We're also going to start be bring, we're going to start bringing more information to the Alaska Industry Council, which which are bi-monthly, to keep you all um, apprised as uh, as to what we are doing with the GPS resiliency. The purpose of that program is if you're flying with GPS and you use the capability that you are able to recover safely and make uh, an informed decision as to either land or to keep flying um, by way of, of VORs or other ground-based navies. That, that's the long and short of it. Um, but we have an, uh, an excellent, for those of you that are able to, to um, just stick around, if you want to come to the WASP booth, Dr. Vince Massimini, who I, I always say is, is actually the father of our VOR, uh, VOR MON program, um, He's here, and as I said, please feel free to, to call or text or whatever if you want more information on that, because it is going to impact your state, we're hoping in a positive way, but we need your input on all of that. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Flight Tech Engineering again, thank them for their partnership and everything that they have been accomplishing, especially some of the recommendations that your membership um, requested through the Alaska Air Carrier Association, the board, such as Point in Space. So thank you, um, Alec. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Test one, two. Hello everyone, I'm Alex Siedler with Flight Tech. I'm gonna grab the uh, pointer here and come to the lower stage for the pre-zo. So I'm gonna talk about uh, WAS navigation improvements in Alaska that have occurred over the last few years and uh, some of the future projects that we're gonna be working on. So I know most of you, uh, or a few of you know me in this room, but just as a, a background for those who don't, uh, Flight Tech, which is a company that I work for, is an authorized navigation service provider. So essentially what that means is we can provide the same services as, as the FAA, but usually on a quicker timeline uh, due to our, our ability to perform our own in-house surveying uh, and our own flight validation authorizations. Uh, we also, as a result of this, are able to build and tailor the procedure for the individual operator and the aircraft that they fly 
which results in a, a much more streamlined and efficient procedure when we're, when we're tailoring that for your individual aircraft. So we're made up of a team of design specialists, uh, terpsters, engineers, validation pilots, and this allows us to handle that whole entire process from concept to the development and ultimately validation and, and publication of the instrument procedure. So our largest service, service region is Alaska. Uh, we cover the entire area from the Arctic to, to the southeast portions of the state. Uh, and we primarily develop for Part 91, 121, 135 operators, and also for private airport owners. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So just a, a few photos of, of uh, locations we've, we've worked at and assisted with, and some of you guys probably recognize these locations um, throughout the state. Uh, so Joanne mentioned this, and, and, and you can see the excellent poster in the, uh, the FA booth, the, at the WASP booth in the exhibitor side. Uh, this is something we're, we're pretty excited about, and you know, we've talked about this for, for a few years, and, and now I think we're, we're going on our almost our, our fourth season now, uh, which is the first WASP LPV approach to water was, uh, was developed here and implemented in Alaska in 2021. This is essentially the same as if we, we put an, a, a multi-million dollar ILS system out in the middle of the, of the water lane and, and provided navigation for that aircraft uh, to, to reach almost Cat 1 ILS minima uh, to the water. Uh, like I said, it's on a fourth, fourth year, uh, providing repeatable IFR seaplane access to defined water lane. Now, we realize this doesn't work out for everyone, especially if you're you're you know, running a sight, sightseeing tour and, and you need people to see what, uh, what they came to actually look at. But for those folks who are running you know, scheduled service to, um, to, to lodges or, or destinations that require water access or water entry, uh, this has been a game changer in, in the industry uh, leading to, to a more reliable and, and safer service to those water lanes. Uh, and, and some exciting news that Joanne kind of alluded to was we just had our second WAS LPV just recently approved, and that's at uh, Kenmore Harbor uh, near Seattle. So it's, it's starting to catch on uh, elsewhere, and um, it's neat to see. Here's a, uh, just a quick shot of well, what, is, what does that look like in, in, uh, in practical application? So here's at, uh, in Southeast Alaska, and you can sort of see the uh, you can see the uh, clouds right down there on, on uh, right at, at tree level. And uh, here's the aircraft on, on its uh, final, final approach. They, they broke out at, at minimums and were able to see the, uh, the marked water lane and, uh, and transition to a, a visual, uh, visual landing phase for uh, bringing in these, these guests from, from Ketchikan. Uh, something we've been working on for the last few years is, is a new concept. Uh, we would like to, to think of it as a, a co-op model of navigation. Uh, we call this the, uh, the NavShare program. And one of our, our first major deployments uh, was in Southeast Alaska, uh, just an area that was really underserved by WAS and, and WAS LPV and LP procedures, uh, mostly because of just challenging terrain, challenging weather conditions. Um, and this, this multi-year project resulted in about 20 new instrument approaches or in, uh, combination of instrument approaches and departures. Uh, these locations include Juneau, Haines, Huna, Sitka, Petersburg, Wrangell, Cake, Cake and Ketchikan, and a handful of other uh, private procedures for, for uh, specific operators as well. Uh, the, oh, I actually clicked something there. Uh, the procedures that are um, part of the NavShare program are available for, for any operator who meets a, the a, a equipage and training qualifications to be able to use those procedures. Uh, in addition to designing procedures for, for, air, for uh, specific operators uh, or, or the NavShare program, we also develop procedures for, uh, these are usually private airport owners, uh, and as a private airport owner, if, if the airport requires permission to use the airport, they're not eligible for, for public distribution. So for those, uh, for those type of uh, airport environment, we, as a, as a FAA authorized service provider, 
uh, work with those airports to develop procedures that it, the operators can use. So once again, we try and tailor those to the operators that are, that are flying to these locations. Um, so some of the airports over the last few years that we've helped out are uh, Donlin Gold. Uh, and uh, just recently, as of last year, a new uh, LPV 200, which is the, the lowest possible um, minimums that you can achieve on, on LPV or ILS. Uh, so down to 200 feet at Red Dog Mine. And then uh, in 2024, we're working on uh, potentially some new projects on the North Slope for increased access for operators up there. And uh, uh, thanks to Joanne also in the, uh, in the Aleutians. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to be able to introduce new WASP solutions out in the Aleutian chain. I, I just wanna talk about non-certified weather program. This is something that um, we, we usually, especially here in Alaska, uh, since the program was built for Alaska, uh, that we, we also deploy uh, in, in concert with the instrument procedures that we develop. So, you know, this is, this is a common topic, right? Are you flying to locations that don't have, don't have destination weather or METAR available? And, uh, or, they might be a destination that, that does have a, a fully certified AWAS system, uh, but might be out of service due to a maintenance issue or part issue or power issue or some other um, scenario. So a few years ago, you guys are, are probably familiar with section 322 of the FAA Reauthorization Act, which required the FAA to permit an air carrier operating part 135 to operate to a destination with a published approach without a destination METAR. So once again, this is, uh, non-contiguous states, so Alaska, Hawaii, requires current area forecast supplemented by non-certified weather observations. And this is the key right here. This can be weather cameras, human observations, um, uh, even automated non-certified systems. Uh, and, and obviously an alternate airport that has approved weather. So the key here being that must have documented approved procedures for departure and route weather evaluation. So speaking of that, um, is this actually in use? And the answer is yes, we have, we, we have been able in the last few years, even as including as recently as a few months ago, uh, been able to get approval for section 322, uh, two different locations just on, on, that we've assisted with for two different operating certificates. Uh, one is an airport in Southeast that has an AWAS system, uh, but commonly finds, finds that AWAS system uh, inoperative or some, some key components such as altimetry um, out of service. Uh, another is a location without a, any AWAS system at all. Uh, this is a private airport with a private approach with vertically guided minimums and L LPV. Uh, it actually supports the, the, uh, the first loss to water procedure. Both those locations have a section 322 program that is operating and enables that, those operators to go in there without that certified weather or AWOS online as if it was a, a normal airport. And it's been working successfully for now going on the, about four years. Uh, so one of the things we do is when we put these procedures in place uh, and, and we identify it's an airport that either has no weather or, um, or weather that's, that's commonly offline, then we, we work with the operator to develop that section 322 program uh, that includes developing documented procedures for how to maintain and, and use all of those weather station instruments, uh, training programs, uh, validation, uh, and uh, ultimately working with your, helping you with your POI submission. And because this is section 322, it's not a, it's not a program that anyone can use. It's an operator specific approval. So you have to think of it that way and they put the, the onus is back on you as the operator to to ensure the equipment is uh, the equipment and training is is uh, up to up to the, the 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 recommendations that have been set forth in the advisory circulars. Uh, so we assist, assist with the OPSPEC edition uh, and can assist with ongoing maintenance of that uh, of those systems. So that's uh, non-certified weather. Now for the uh, get into the exciting part of the uh, the presentation here. Uh, we're going to. Our next demonstration or discussion is going to be on the, the WAS fixed swing point, point in space demonstration. Uh, so this was graciously sponsored by the FAA WAS Program Management Office. 
This has been a two-phase project. Uh, last year, you heard me present on the first phase, which was in McCarthy, Alaska, which was the first uh, point, WASP point in space demonstration project. Uh, last summer, we just wrapped up Rampart, Alaska, which was a, a even more interesting location. Uh, and that data collected will be used to make these recommendations to the FAA for eventual adoption of this program to allow new navigation capabilities to airports that were previously underserved. Airports and even landing fields or, or new water lanes, uh, other challenging locations. So for that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Nathan Kurth, who is the uh, lead flight validator on the, on the mission. And uh, he's gonna share with you some, some uh, not only an overview of the, um, of the second phase of the project, but also a actual in-flight video of the validation for um, the second WAS LPV point in space. I know it's a lot, demonstration project. Thank you, Alec. Appreciate it. Appreciate it from everybody as well. So as he mentioned, um, I was fortunate enough to be the uh, flight validation pilot on um, this demonstration, so our, our second demonstration. And as a quick overview um, to talk about the WASP point in space um, project, um, obviously it exists out there in the rotorcraft world. Most of you have probably seen those procedures, um, but there is nothing for fixed wings specifically. So this demonstration project um, was to um, challenge us to um, prove that we can do this with fixed wing, um, utilizing WASP technology and LPV um, lines of minimum. So looking into this, looking at the WASP um, um, technology, uh, one of the challenges that we had was um, demonstrating um, using a remote altimeter setting. Um, most of these or this idea is um, in a remote location to have these procedures um, um, put in place. So there is no local altimeter setting in, in uh, a, a location that we've chosen. So remote using a remote weather for demonstration, demonstration, and then challenged with coming up with a solution using the WAS signal um, to derive altimetry. So our solution was to use our GPS altitude. And we use that GPS altitude to set the altitude into our altimeter. Um, and we're using that geo-referenced altitude at that point. And we have um, a, 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 um, a point on the procedure that we coined a uh, barrow sync point, which I'll talk about. And that is just an action that you take during the procedure to um, set your altimeter to your GPS um, reference altitude. We've tested this on common avionics. So our first phase was on a Garmin, Gar, excuse me, a Garmin platform. Um, we also wanted to expand that um, test bed. Um, so we also utilized a Honeywell avionics platform. And this just proves that it can be uh, performed on multiple platforms, not just one, recognizing that most operators up here are most likely using Garmin avionics suites. Just as an overview of our phase one demonstration at McCarthy, this is just the design overview. Um, it's basically a standard um, RNAV type procedure. Um, where it gets interesting is the, the final approach segment. Um, in this, the only piece I'd really wanna highlight is um, it was more aligned with the runway. So not exactly aligned, it's about 20 degree offset, um, but you could see the runway environment from the FAF. So, that was kind of our phase one implementation of this to, to work into this demonstration project to see if it would work. Obviously it did in the phase one. And so we wanted to, oh, and then there's the McCarthy chart. So um, breaking down the chart again, just looking um, at that final approach um, segment, um, the airport's right there. So about 20 degrees offset from the final approach course. Um, moving forward, into our second demonstration, we picked Rampart, Alaska, because it's taking what we learned in the first demonstration project and expanding on it and, and trying to find a location that had a little bit more of a challenge to it and maybe more similar to how operators in Alaska are going to utilize this type of procedure. So um, Rampart's in a, you know, a somewhat remote location along the Yukon River. Um, there's undulating terrain in that area. Um, 
more complex runway scenario. So you can't really see the runway from the approach. It's hidden behind a small hill, and I'll highlight that in some a uh, couple of these additional slides. So that these pieces kind of made uh, Rampart a really excellent second um, demonstration project. This is just an overview again of the Rampart procedure. So somewhat similar to the McCarthy, but I'll uh, procedure, but I'll dive in here a, a little bit more. Um, starting at the uh, IAF, um, it is connected to a T route, um, standard initial segment. So it flies just the same as a normal RNAV GPS procedure to a runway end. Um, the intermediate segment, again, is very similar, flies the same. Um, everything starts to get interesting and unique in that final segment. Um, what's important to note here, as I mentioned, um, in, in relation to McCarthy, is there's the rampart runway in green right there. It's offset about 47 degrees from the final approach course. And you can kind of see the, the undulating terrain here that hides the runway environment. Um, so that's a, an important piece to, to um, recognize there. Um, so when, when I say standard RNAV procedure, it's RNP 1.0 on the approach transitions, which is standard intermediate segment and missed approach. The final segment is RNP 0.30. Um, looking at the rampart chart in a little more detail, um, I won't get too much in detail with, um, whoops, there we go, the uh, initial fix, the, the initial segment in the, in the IAF, the initial fix, just because, again, it flies very similar to a normal RNAV procedure. Where things start to get different and unique are on the final segment, um, looking down in, oops, in the profile view. We'll see here, there's a Barrow sink point right there, and it is um, located at the waypoint prior to the FAF. So that is the location that we would set our GPS um, altitude on our altimeter and adjust um, our, our altimeter to match that. Um, additionally, um, looking back up at the plan form, uh, the missed approach point is uh, a good distance away from the actual runway environment. Um, there's a couple. There's a reason why we did this because it allows the uh, the pilot and the air crew to transition from an IFR environment to a visual VFR environment um, in in enough time to maneuver visually to execute a successful landing wherever they're going to be. Um, in this scenario, Rampart is the primary landing facility, but it doesn't um, limit where the air crew can land. So it could be at a lodge on the water, a uh, hunting camp, um, anywhere in that area that. Um, dumps you into that valley that you would have a need to land at. Um, another interesting piece here with the missed approach point is the missed approach point is co-located with the DA. So when you get to the missed approach point, you hit your DA, um, which is a little different than most procedures. Um, you usually arrive at your DA prior to the actual missed approach point, which would be at the runway end. Um, so we purposely co-located that there. Um, one of the reasons why is if you look at the minimums, we set the minimums of this procedure to align with part 135 VFR minimums, but also allows for obstacle um, clearance. So we're using obstacle criteria and all of the, this design to ensure uh, adequate terrain um, uh, safety. Um, so we've set that up again to, make, to uh, set you up for that visual environment, that VFR environment. Um, also, if you notice on the plan form, we've got a couple um, diagrams. So these are our visual segment maps, and I'll expand upon these in the next slide so you can see them a little bit better. Um, but it outlines the area um, where you transition from an IFR environment into a visual segment um, or VFR um, flying segment. So here's a, here's a little closer look at those um, visual segment and area assessment charts. So first we'll look at this one. This is the final approach course line, um, the missed approach point. The yellow line, dashed line here, is a direct line to the runway, the primary runway in this case. Obviously, it, again, as I mentioned before, that's not necessarily where um, you would have to land. It's just showing this is the maybe the primary landing area for this procedure. You also don't need to follow this yellow line. That's just the direct path. So you can navigate visually as you need to into that runway um, to execute a landing. Um, also, it shows you um, basically a go around um, back to a missed approach environment if 
you um, are beyond the map and you need to get back on that procedure and execute the missed approach, but you're beyond the missed approach point and you're in visual in a visual environment, a VFR condition. Um, part of that looking over here um, is going to be our assessment area. So there's our map co-located with the DAA and I'll just zoom back out on that. Um, 45 degrees on either the direction of the map DA, about a three mile nautical mile length out and that area we ran through our um, obstacle criteria. So that's a controlled environment, even though you're VFR in that. So if you're maintaining that minimum um, hat, which was 522 in this um, example, in this procedure, um, you're assured obstacle clearance as long as you're within this um, cone. That doesn't allow you to fly IFR past the, the map, but it does allow you um, in low weather conditions where you do have uh, VFR requirements and visibility to, to continue on and assure your safety just a, a further degree than being completely on your own. It also allows going back to this for this go around execution to reestablish yourself on the missed approach um, portion of the procedure. Um, going back to the assessment area as well, just to highlight rampart is right here. Again, doesn't mean you have to land there, but that provides you an initial area um, to continue on to where you could feasibly land. Again, water, a lodge, sandbar, um, whatever you might be executing. This is just a visual representation uh, from the cockpit during our flight validation um, that shows um, where the rampart runway is with the white dashed line. That's not the flight um, direction, um, the actual final approach course is here. This is from the FAF. Um, it's just showing where Rampart is and highlights that you can't see the runway from the FAF. Um, so local knowledge, you would understand where the runway would be. Um, but if you shot this approach for the first time, obviously, you, you don't see that runway. Um, so again, um, kind of alluding to a typical operation that um, may occur up here in a remote location. Talking about the, ro the remote altimeter weather, so we, we did multiple passes, um, one utilizing remote weather. Um, we're outside of the FAA requirement for distance. So these, these are actually my notes during the flight validation. Um, we, we are looking at three different locations, Tanana, Fairbanks, and Bettles. Um, on the chart, we actually use Tanana, um, ASOS as our remote altimeter setting. Um, it's roughly about 30 nautical miles away or excuse me, <laughs> 70 miles away. Um, Fairbanks, 65 miles away, and then Bettles was 86 nautical miles away. And we compared altimeter settings in flight, um, conversing with the pilot myself, just to understand what those differences might uh, be. We used Bettles because it's the furthest away, just to um, highlight that difference in um, distance with the procedure where we're at. And just to visually show this on a VFR uh, chart, uh, Rampart is here in that blue highlighted area, uh, Fairbanks, um, Tanana, and then Battles up there. And the distance, the actual distance here that we calc that are just for flight calculations, 90.6 nautical miles. So we're we're guesstimating in the cockpit there, but we're we're in the ballpark. So um, again, our first pass, we use that remote altimeter setting evaluated our procedure with that, came back and did our, our barrow sink um, idea on the second pass. This is actual GPS track data of one of our passes. This would be our barrow sink um, pass, so where we use our GPS altitude setting into the altimeter. Um, the green line here indicates our um, actual path on the procedure. Um, all of this grayed out area with the white lines is the procedure design with the obstacle clearance um, zones, including controlling obstacles in red. Um, the highlight here that you notice is um, this data shows how accurate WAS is utilized in the cockpit. And we're maintaining center line and there's very small undulations off the center line, if at all, for the entire procedure. And you know, a good portion of this is just RMP 1.0 and then the final LPV section, um, RMP 0.3. Um, and then you can see the visual maneuver 
landing at the runway at Rampart. Um, so that's just an interesting um, graphic and we maintain these data feeds um, and store them. So every flight validation we do, we have this as a background and we can evaluate um, the performance of the aircraft um, on these procedures and the procedure itself. So along with the procedure, we actually have a departure as well. Um, goes along with the whole VFR um, idea with um, point in space. So in this case, our departure um, does not start at the runway. You see this little piece right there, that's the rampart runway. The departure starts out here at our first waypoint um, at an appropriate altitude for the departure procedure. So it's a little different than a normal departure where it commences right at the runway. You take off, you're on the departure procedure. Um, you're, you're flying your avionics. You may be coupled with autopilot once you hit a certain altitude. Um, this is a unique perspective because you actually, and the routing description actually states take off from airport um, or landing area as, as we would progress from an evaluation to a real world scenario. Depart and maintain VFR and climb to cross in this case, RMPD-1, which is just our first waypoint on the departure, um, at or above 820 feet. So again, we are building in Part 135 VFR requirements plus obstacle clearance um, from at least the primary um, piece there, but it's up to the operator to um, get from your landing or your takeoff area um, or the place you're departing from to the first point on the departure procedure VFR. Once you arrive there, um, then you're on the departure procedure and it flies um, very similar to a normal departure procedure. It's just getting there is the difference. Um, it, one of the interesting pieces that we noted as well is you don't have to fly direct from the runway or your departure uh, point. So you can navigate VFR the way you would need to. So in this case, um, we flew the Yukon River and then um, as close as, as we could get to our first waypoint and then continued on the departure um, at that point. So at this time, uh, we have the actual demonstration video that shows in cockpit. It'll show um, the avionics with external views and we have point outs um, of important pieces. Um, and I'll just kind of talk through those. I won't use the pointer because it kind of zooms in on that certain piece, but I'll just highlight um, the, the, the barrow sync point, uh, the rotor, remote altimeter settings, the co-located map DA, um, the execution of the missed approach, um, and, and you can just watch the video as well as, as I talk through it. So we did utilize Alaska Air Transit PC-12 on this flight um, with the Honeywell system as I previously mentioned. Uh, departing from Merrill Field, we flew IFR area where we need a little bit like the initial approach fix. Just a quick overview of the chart. So this is our first test, as I mentioned, remote uh, barrel altimeter. Um, so we set in the remote altimeter setting. And this is fast forward approaching the FAF LPV. You can see we have LPV intercept at the FAF. Uh, external view inside the FAF coming up to the missed approach point. Again, our co-located map DA, so there's 820 feet. Uh, we cycle through to the missed approach segment of the procedure. So on this pass, we fly the full missed approach out to the hold and execute a hold just uh, as part of our flight evaluation um, piece. So test two, again, barrow sync to WAS altimetry. The GPS altitude is gonna be down in the lower um, right there. It's very, very hard to see, it's 2600. We set 2600 in on the altimeter or, um, for our altitude, which actually gives us our altimeter setting for that. Um, again, flying uh, the final approach, coming up on the map DA. Um, we have LPV intercept and capture, 820 feet. Um, this is transitioning to a visual maneuvering uh, to landing. You can see the undulating terrain. Uh, there's rampart runway to the left. 
and again, the, 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 the flight crew is um, open to navigate as they need into their landing destination from that map DA. So once we're on the ground here, what we did is a quick um, GPS altitude um, test between field elevation, setting in the field elevation and then setting in uh, GPS altitude is a difference of seven feet. Um, and then now we're on the VFR departure um, section of our departure procedure. So we're departing VFR. Um, and again, the flight crew is going to navigate um, visually to that first point. So here we are flying the Yukon River, um, navigating towards that first point of the departure. And we'll end up eventually over land there, grab that first VFR point at or above 820 feet. And then we're cycling through the departure procedure and it flew um, exactly like a normal departure procedure. You couldn't tell the difference. So that's an overview of our demonstration project. It was a huge success. It flew as expected, um, no anomalies, um, nothing that was surprising that, or that stood out that wouldn't make this a functional uh, approach procedure. Um, is there anything that I missed that you want to add on to while we're at that point? Or at this point? No, I think you covered it. You know, this is not only can it be used, um, this WASP point in space for, for a fixed wing point in space, but also has potential cap compatibility with um, other forms of future navigation, such as. Um, you know, UAS systems that are flying uh, to, a, to a point in space and transition to a, a, a vertical phase of flight for, um, for reliance on their own sensor navigation or obstacle avoidance systems. So um, a couple of different uses for this type of technology. But at this point, we'll turn it over to uh, Q&A if you guys have any questions. Thank you, thank you so much. Any questions for myself or them? One thing I would like to stress, um, they do believe, flight tech engineering, that humility is a virtue. So they're not going to, while they're promoting the wonderful work that they're doing, and we're promoting their work as well, um, they're not, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, there are so many advantages to what they have just shown us. I, I had stressed earlier that the FAA themselves don't have the resources or the funding or the automation to do this. Well, what happens now, Joanne? Well, now that we have taken our taxpayers' dollars and at your requests, and we've been able to contract with Flight Tech Engineering to demonstrate these procedures that we would not have had if you had left it just up to the FAA. Now we've completed that. We collect data. We analyze the data. We demonstrate to flight standards that yes, these can be flown. They can be flown safety. And if you made the investments in your fleet with purchasing WAS LPV, now you too can, can fly these. We're always looking for ways so that, that you get more bang for your buck because you've invested so much money in WAS LPV avionics for your fleet. With these particular approaches, once we collect the data, give it to flight standards, they will then develop criteria that we require so that we can go to other locations and do additional point in space. Um, some of the approaches that we're doing right now are specials because they have to be specials. If we didn't do the people ask us, well, why aren't you doing public approaches? You know, we, we don't want all of these specials. The only way you're ever going to get public approaches at some of these runway ends is by enabling us to work with companies such as Flight Tech Engineering to actually publish these special approaches. Because again, we, we uh, publish the special approaches, we collect criteria, we do the analysis, and then we give it to flight standards. Flight standards looks at it. Again, they say, yep, this is, this is safe. We can do this if you're equipped with WAS LPV, blah, 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 blah. And then they will take that criteria, and then we will have um, whatever is required for us to produce 
public approaches in locations rather than just the specials. Uh, so I, 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 I wanted to, to stress that. Um, the other thing I wanted to stress was um, the importance of the Aleutian chain. You may recall through the years, those of you that are familiar with, um, with the navigation program and what we try to do with the geos that we contract with, um, WAS is enabled not only through use of the GPS satellites that are available, but also geos. Well, we swap out our contracts every couple of years with the geos, not necessarily because the geo has gone bad, but because we know eventually um, that we will need another geo and we keep three or four geos uh, online at all times, which means we also have to start planning for what the next geo is going to be. Well, the, the significance of that is what kind of coverage are we going to get with these new geos? And for those of you that have been around long enough, you know that the initial geos, we didn't cover the northwest portion or the uh, west portion of the Aleutian chain or northwest Alaska very well with our geos. But what we committed to you in the state of Alaska was that every contract, new contract that we have with a geo, we are going to continue increasing our WAS availability and WAS coverage through the Aleutian chain so that we have the sufficient availability and coverage so that we can have WAS LPV approaches and or even just LP approaches. And the fact that we are now considering for 2024 some work in the Aleutian chains, uh, particularly in the, in the Dutch Harbor area for right now, um, I, I hope that demonstrates to you that we have indeed been uh, trying to keep our promise and look every time we have a new geo to increase our coverage westward. Uh, so this really is very good news, very exciting news that we, we seriously now have the coverage that we need, maybe not to extreme west dilution chain, but, it, but, but we're, making, we're making our way there. Um, and as far as why we chose some of the selection, uh, the selected the locations we did, gentlemen, thank you. I think you provided a very good explanation. Um, for the very first one, we, we really did want low hanging fruit because of the very reasons that I said that we need to demonstrate two flight standards. So we needed to select locations that we knew were going to be successful. Then the second one, as you said, a little more challenging. And now that we have the two under our belt, hopefully we, we can, as I said, um, we're working with flight standards to get more of the criteria developed. So the other locations that so many of you have, came, uh, that have come to us with, we can start looking at those locations as well. Um, is there anything else that I may have missed? Or Cornell Walker, uh, Dr. Massimini, anything else to add? Okay. And well, thank you. I know we're, we're a little behind, but thank you so much. And we'll be here for another hour, and, and plus you have our contact information if you ever have any more questions. Thank you, gentlemen. And Rich Scott, got to introduce Rich Scott as well, another very important member of, of the Flight Tech Engineering team. So thank you. Thank you all. We uh, appreciate those updates as always. And uh, this brings us to our final presentation of the evening and of the main convention itself. So I want to share a brief story. It won't take long. Um, I, was, I was approached a while back, Alan Stevens, uh, who is the VP of Regulatory Affairs with NATA, came and uh, reached out to me and suggested that we do something together. And that was our business aviation roundtable. So, some of you may have been at that meeting. It was an opportunity for you to share what you experience, your challenges, your issues with NATA directly. And it was successful. We, we heard a lot. Um, so Alan's gonna talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but I just wanna take a second to say that we are very excited to be partnering with someone who has a national focus and can help us to, to focus our issues and combine the weight of their advocacy with ours in order to get more done at a national level. So thank you very much. I'm gonna introduce, excuse me, introduce both Alan and, and also Keith DeBerry, who's with us in the back. He is the COO of NATA. Alan, here you go. Thank you. And uh, I think you're queuing up a slide show there. Now you're gonna test my knowledge here, I guess. Okay. 
I'll let uh, Will help you there real quick. While he's doing that, uh, I just wanted to um, say a big thank you to Will, uh, to the Alaska Air Care Association uh, for having us here, also for hosting the Business Aviation Roundtable that we did just a few months ago. Uh, we look forward to this uh, partnership, and what we're going to show you in just a moment is kind of, you know, what is that about? So what? 